All right, well, good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. We want to welcome you all to our services online once again this week. Um, and from all of your pastors to you as you're watching at home, let me just encourage you to please keep up with our announcements every week. Uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, it seems, and that's what we're praying toward and hoping toward. So we're hoping that within the near foreseeable future that we will be able to meet together uh, here to, in this building corporately once again. But the way things work is we have to be very cautious about the way we do that um, and how, how quickly things roll out from the government. So please just bear with us and keep up with us as every day and week we're assessing the situation, um, looking toward that end goal and praying toward that that end goal that God will allow us to, to meet together once again. We're encouraged by that though, and we're happy for that. And I want to encourage you all to be, as we're looking toward that light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, uh, I want to encourage you all to please be thinking again about the witness that we give the world right now. Um, just before this service, we were talking and brother Greg was mentioning airplanes and how when the plane drops and the storm hits, how quickly we're brought to the realization that there is a lot going on around that small little aircraft that is very threatening and very real. Um, there's, a, there's a thin veneer of safety when you're sitting in your seat and you're reading your book on an airplane. We all know that there's a lot going on around us and that we're part of something much bigger than ourselves, but it's very easy to put up that veneer and to just act as if everything is calm and in control. I just want to draw your attention, whatever your opinion on the COVID-19 situation is, what it's certainly done for a world around us is it's brought that bigger reality into focus. That thin veneer has been shaken. Our safety and our feeling of well-being has been shaken for many. And people have been brought to the realization that there is a whole world going on around them that is very threatening and very scary for those who are not in Christ. And people have been brought, brought to that realization through this whole thing. Take advantage of that as a believer. When we come together as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we celebrate the fact that no matter what's going on around us, that there's a God who rests above it and who is directing and controlling and guiding all things in this, in this realm. And so we have a great hope, a great peace, and a great confidence through these times. When that veneer gets shaken and we look around, we're not scared and we're not timid. But let me encourage you that that's not the case for a world who does not walk with the Lord. So please, as we come back together and we're celebrating and, you know, eventually able to, to greet one another, hopefully with hugs down the road and seeing one another in the church building, remember that there's a world who needs that witness and that we need to be consistent with that witness. Let me direct your attention as I close here just to some words from the, the letter of Jude. At the very end of the letter of Jude, we read this in verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Join me in praying this morning. Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, that Though the world changes, and it changes rapidly at times, God, you don't change. God, we thank you that when men are shaken, that you have never shaken. God, thank you that when we cannot see the end or even see the very near future, Lord, you tell us you have written the end from the beginning and can tell us why. God, thank you for your sovereignty. And thank you for your love for your children that so comforts us. God, I pray that we would keep in mind the task we've been called to, the family that we're a part of, and the God that we serve, Lord. And we pray this in the name of the Father, through the Son, and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Good morning, Calvary Baptist. Kids, we cannot wait until we can meet until we can see y'all again, until we can dive into God's word with you once again together. But until then, we have been putting out these videos. We've been reading the biggest story by Kevin DeYoung. We have had our weekly memory verses. This week, our verse was 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. 
This morning, I want to talk about these verses. The reason this is so important to us is, guys, this is the gospel. And that is one thing that we want you to know is what the gospel is. Is So I'm going to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 4. Now I made a deal with someone. Whoever, whatever kid could send me a video of them reading 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4, of them quoting that, was going to get to pick a free book. So hopefully y'all can get a video to me. Here we go. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Guys, this is the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for our sin in accordance to his word. But not only that he died, but that he rose again after he was buried in accordance to his scriptures. That is the gospel. Thank you, Brother Mac. Good morning again, brothers and sisters. This morning we're going to continue worship. We're going to sing together. And so I pray that you would sing out loud in your homes with your families. And we're going to sing songs uh, of doctrine, songs of the, about the foundation of our faith. Righteousness is all our plea. The laws demands are satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. Glory, glory, glory to God. alone we have been saved. All that we are has come from you. 
Hearts that were once by sin enslaved, now by your power have been made new. Now by your power have been made new. Glory. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the truth and the power of your word. And God, I am grateful that men and women, faithful saints throughout the ages, have written songs that line up so clearly and closely with your word, that we can sing, that we can memorize scripture this way, that we can memorize core doctrines of the faith and teach them to our children. So God, thank you for singing. Thank you for your saints singing at home. And Father, I pray that as your word is preached and as your saints listen at home, I pray that you would change hearts, that you would encourage the feeble, and that you would bind up the broken. My God, I pray that you would do exactly what you want to do today, like we know that you will. All these things we pray through the authority and the power of Jesus in his name and what he did on the cross. Amen.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. I do pray that all of you are doing well. And let me echo what Pastor Josh said just a moment ago. Uh, make sure that you uh, tune in very regularly, uh, especially this next Wednesday night, so that you can hear an update uh, on the um, starting back of meeting together again. So we want to inform you on how we're going to do this. We have a plan in place and we want to abide by the state regulations and to uh, have a soft start so that we can be as safe as we possibly can in this transition. And so make sure you stay informed and you'll be hearing some things from us very soon. Go ahead and take your Bibles and open them up with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and when you find chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 21. So 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 21 is our text for this morning. And the title of today's sermon is No Fear in Love. No Fear in in love. Most people who read the Greek would agree that 1 John, uh, his epistles, are some of the easiest letters to learn how to read Greek. So if you were to look in the New Testament and you compared 1 John to, I don't know, let's say the book of Romans. Uh, you would find that the Greek language in 1 John is uh, simpler. The syntax, the organization of the language is uh, simpler in its form. However, the structure of 1 John can often be very difficult. And what I mean by structure is how the author, who is John, organizes his thoughts. Whenever you're reading 1 John, you see these big themes, and he seems to jump around. He kind of uh, jumps back and forth from theme to theme, and he uses the phrase, by this. And sometimes we don't know if the antecedent of this is what John just said, or if the antecedent of this is what he is going to say. And so it can be very challenging piecing together the thoughts of John as we... Uh, as you read through this, and sometimes it often even sounds redundant. But one of the ways that we can uh, organize our, uh, or our thoughts around what John is saying is looking at how those themes are coming together. And so chapter 4, we've already discussed one of the major themes, which is in verse 1 through 6. And that was how the Holy Spirit is given to us to be able to discern the difference between truth and error. And so we're able to see that in verses 1 through 6. And then we see in verses 7 through 12, we see the major theme is how the Holy Spirit works in the, through the love of God, by showing us the love of God and enables us to love others. And in our text today, the big theme is how the Holy Spirit assures us of God's love in us. And so it's really about how the Holy Spirit has worked to assure us and to give us confidence in God's love. So it's somewhat similar in the theme of God's love, but there's a different focus from what we heard last week. So this is about God wanting believers to have absolute confidence in his love for us. So let's read this passage, 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. 
By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because he is because as he is so also are we in this world there is no love and fear but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love we love because he first loved us if anyone says i love god and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love god whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, last week we were able to see that John was showing Christians that the natural thing for us to do, it's the most natural part of our makeup is to love. And that seems strange because it probably feels very unnatural sometimes to love. But I think that if we really understand what John is saying, we naturally love because of who God is in our life. God is love. And we love because of who he is. We love because God loved us. God sent his son to die on a cross so that he could be the propitiation for our sins. He settled the wrath of God and our debt of sin. And so that message in and of itself shows us that we are loved. And so God has placed his spirit in us. And the fruit of the spirit uh, is love. What, one of the, 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 in the list of all of the fruit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, 22, love is the first one mentioned. And so this is what God does in us. It's what God has shown to us and and his spirit is living that love in and through us. And so that's why I believe that we can understand it should be a natural thing for us to love because of how God has loved us. But from understanding what John is saying, we, we can also see that the spirit is ultimately how we love. We are absolutely dependent on the spirit of God for all things and love is one of those things. So do not get the idea that John is saying that we can just love on our own, that we should just love independent of the Spirit. No, quite the opposite. We need the Spirit of God in order to be able to love with the love of God. So John closed his last section in verse 12 by saying this, No one has ever seen God. And that if we love one another, God's, God abides in us and his love is perfected. That word perfected means completed. It's complete in us. Now John is showing us, and it's important that we look at verse 12 as we jump into verse 13, because John is John's showing us nobody has seen God. But, but he is saying, I believe through that, that we, we can demonstrate God's love so that the world can see the evidence of God's love. They can see that completed work of God in us. You see, the, the world can see in us that God's love is in us and, and they can see that love being demonstrated and displayed. The world will even know, according to John uh, chapter 13, that, that, that it is by our love for other people that they will know that we belong to God. So you see, all, although God is unseen, well, that doesn't mean that he cannot be known. Uh, the Spirit of God in John chapter 3 is described as wind. It's compared to wind. It, the, the Spirit is compared to wind. And something we all know about wind is we, we can't see it. It's, it's invisible. But, but we know its very presence when we breathe. We, we breathe in air. And so... It's invisible, but it's very present. Well, God is invisible, but he is very present in us 
by the Holy Spirit. So John, again, he says in verse 12, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And so he's just showing us, when we see this phrase over and over again, he abides in us. Well, he's talking about his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is in us and also by his Holy Spirit in us, that is how God has made his love complete in us. John says nearly the same thing in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us. So he's talking about this completeness of God's love in our lives. Now in both of these verses, the verb perfected means, or is in the passive tense, meaning that, that we are the subjects and we're being acted upon. God is, is doing something or has done something in our life. This is his work. This is how he is at work in our lives. And John is just showing us through this completed love that believers can have absolute assurance, absolute confidence of God's love in their life. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of piece a puzzle together. And then after we do that, I, I pray that you'll be able to see this magnificent picture of God's completed love in our lives. So first John shows us that the Holy Spirit assures believers of God's love by abiding in us. Look at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, when we look at this verse in light of verse 10, we see a massive part of this, this picture. In verse 10, uh, we see, or, or in verses 10, in contrast that with verse 13, we see the work of the Trinity. We see that God is at work through the Trinity in our salvation. And what we see is that the Father, in verse 10, has sent the Son. So this is the Father. God the Father is in love with us, demonstrating His love by sending. And then we see the, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. God sent His only Son, Jesus and Jesus died on the cross to be the propitiation of our sins, to settle the wrath of God and to settle our sin debt. And so we see the Father, we see the Son, and then we see in verse 13, uh, we see that the Holy Spirit is abiding in us. This is the Holy Spirit because He has given us His Spirit. And so we can understand then what he means in verse 12 when he says that his love has been perfected. You see, by the act of what God the Father did through the act of what God the Son did and then the act of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And so now we see that the completion of this love is brought together. It is the Spirit of God who brings that love to a perfected state in, in the believer. You know, Baptists are often afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. I, I think we're just fearful sometimes because we don't really understand all of what the Holy Spirit does. Well, if you read the Gospel of John, you see he shows the work of the Holy Spirit in, in one way. And here in 1 John, we see some different elements and different ways that the Holy Spirit works. But it's very specific in 1 John to the life of the believer and how he's at work in, in, in our lives and how he's abiding in us. John wants us to know we can trust the Holy Spirit. We can trust that he will be faithful to keep us in Christ. We are in him. And he's also faithful to grow us in our knowledge and to grow us in our love for God. And so the Holy Spirit is the presence of God in our life. And he will never leave us alone. So we are assured of God's love. By this abiding presence, the Holy Spirit is a promise of God that he would come and he would abide in and indwell the believer. And so John wants us to know that we are assured of God's love by the Holy Spirit at work in us. Now then, John shows us another piece of this completed love. The Holy Spirit assures us of God's love through the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior 
of the world. Now you may not see the Trinity. You see at least two parts of the Trinity in this verse. We see the Father and we see the Son, but we need to understand the word and is a conjunction and it connects verse 13 to verse 14, meaning that just as we can be certain of God's love for us by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we are also certain of God's love. We are assured of God's love by the gospel that is revealed to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, John says we have seen and testify. Now, John is specifically talking about the apostles and how they were able to visibly see the work and the miracles and hear the teachings of Jesus Christ and his incarnate work while he was on this earth. And, and, and we also see that he was... Uh, that, that they were testifying of this gospel message that had been entrusted to them. But I think it's important for us to understand something about what John is saying here. Because there were many people who were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ and they never believed in him as Lord and Savior. They never called on his name to save them. And the difference between those who did not recognize Jesus when they saw him and heard his teaching and those who did believe in him when they saw him and they heard his teaching, the difference is the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit was in their lives showing them that this was the one that the scriptures had prophesied of. He opened their eyes to see that this was Jesus and he opened their ears to the teachings and, and their mouths to the testifying. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and what we see is, the Holy Spirit is just wanting us to be assured here of God's love. We are assured of God's love by the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, John, in his gospel, uh, wrote one of the most beloved verses. I mean, every one of you can probably quote John 3.16. And I think that verse is so, so wonderful because it just encompasses everything about God's love. For God so loved. Well, his love is amazing. When you read the New Testament, you will see the Apostle Paul and other apostles just talking about the greatness of his love. Oh, his love is so great. It's so wonderful. It's so magnificent. So God's love is amazing. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his only begotten son. What well, we see that his love is a giving love. God has given his love. God doesn't just accidentally spill his love out. He intentionally gives his love. His love is a giving love. That whosoever believes in him, well, his love is a receiving love. It's able to be received. One can be a recipient of that love. And those who do, though, that whosoever believes in him, will not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God is an ever lasting love. And this is, I believe, what John is ultimately showing in 1 John chapter 4, 9 through 10 from last week when we saw this verse. It says, in this, the love of God was manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, this is the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ given to us by the Holy Spirit. He is revealing these things to us and it should give believers tremendous confidence, tremendous assurance of God's love to know that the Trinitarian God of glory demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, God wants us to have assurance. I, I don't think you can read this without seeing how much God wants us to be so certain of his love for us. He just wants us to know that he's given us his spirit to abide in us, to be with us. He has given us through the Holy Spirit the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. We, apart from that revealed gospel, you and I would never know how much God loved us. And that's, that's a work of the Spirit. Well, then we see, thirdly, that the Holy Spirit assures believers of God's love through revealing personal salvation. Look in verse 15. Whosoever or whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, 
God abides in him and he in God. Now again, you're seeing that over and over again. God abides in him and he in God. That's the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. That's God present in us and us being in him. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one though here and, and that, we're, that we're able to see in scripture that reveals faith. For with the mouth or for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. But we need to know that the only way that we can confess Jesus Christ is through the initiating work of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 makes this very clear. Paul says, you absolutely cannot confess Jesus as your Lord without, without the Holy Spirit. And so this is important. We need to know that the only way one can be assured of God's love, God's salvation in their life, the only way that they could be certain of their salvation is if their salvation is a work of God. And the, the only way that we can know that it's a work of God is if God has revealed that to us. And God reveals his love, he reveals salvation to us by the Holy Spirit. I was eight years old whenever I confessed Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Now, I want you to think about that. I was eight years old. Today, I'm 41 years old, and I'm still standing on that confession. Now, how in the world can an eight-year-old boy make a decision that will change his life forever? I submit to you that the only way that that is possible is that if that confession was that of the work of the Holy Spirit. And I believe to this day that it absolutely was because it is the Holy Spirit who convinces us of sin. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers us to confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is the Holy Spirit who transforms our lives, who transforms our state from being sinful to being righteous. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to grow in our knowledge and love of God and it is the Holy Spirit who will complete our salvation from beginning all the way till the time that Jesus returns Paul said Philippians 1 6 being confident of this very thing that he who started that good work in you will bring it about to completion at the revealing of Jesus Christ but we see here in verse 16 that we are able to see this working in such completeness through the Holy Spirit who indwells me and indwells you as a believer and allows us to be partakers of the divine life of God. Now, now we don't see in this verse that God makes us little gods. What we are able to see that God allows us to partake in his divine life. But look at what it says, verse 16. So we have come to know. We've come to this place of knowledge that God has, has brought us to. We've come to it because the Holy Spirit has brought us here to know and to believe that the love of God, the love that God has for us. God wants us to know this. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in Him. We have come to know and to place our trust in God's love because we have the indwelling God in our lives. God who is love lives in us by his Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that an amazing thought? God who is love is the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Knowing all of this, enhances my assurance. It gives me assurance of God and his love, which is what John wants for the believers. It's what the Holy Spirit, who is inspiring John, wants for believers. God wants us to have confidence in his love. Now this really ultimately brings up another question because, you know, I mean, that's a great thought. 
I'm certain that God loves me, but what does that assurance do? Well, that, that's a good question. Because I believe that now John transfer, uh, transfers or from uh, transitions from teaching us about how this completeness works together, how we can have certainty through the work of the Holy Spirit who is given to us by God to abide in us, to indwell us. Through the gospel that reveals to us how much God demonstrated his love to us all the way to our personal salvation in which the Holy Spirit enabled us to recognize our sin, to be convicted of our sin and to confess Jesus as our Savior. Well, that assurance does something. And John now shares with us what that is. The assurance of God's love will give us confidence for the day of judgment. Look at what he says in verse 17. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. Now, I've already said this, but let me say it again. A perfected love is a completed love. It's a love that God has brought to completion. John is showing us that the love of God has not only been completed in us, but this is a love that absolutely and completely overwhelms us. I, I mean, this, this just overwhelms me. It, it completely touches me in such a way. I, I, I believe I can say like Paul, and I believe whenever you're going to hear Paul say what he said in Romans chapter 8, what you're hearing is a man who understood the completeness of God's love in his life, but was completely overwhelmed by that love. Listen to what he says, Romans chapter 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, if Paul was able to say those words with such overwhelming completeness, now then we can say, certainly as John is wanting us to affirm in our own lives we have the assurance of God's love and we therefore can have confidence in the day of judgment. You see, when we think of the judgment of God, I think in all of our minds, we think of the most terrible thing. The law is a scary thing. It's a scary thing if you ever look in those mirrors of yours and see those lights behind you. That's just, a, that's just not a good sight. It's always negative. The law is scary and so the judgment seems to bring an idea of punishment. And let me just digress a moment and say 
something I think that is of the utmost importance here for those who are not in Christ, those who do not have his love abiding on them, they should be fearful. They should be afraid of God's judgment and that could be one of you right now listening. You should be fearful of the judgment of God if you do not have his love abiding on you. You see the opposite is true of God's love abiding on us. For those who are without Christ, the wrath of God is abiding upon you. Take the time to read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards to get a fullness of the wrath of God against those who do not know him. But for those who have the love of God abiding on them, for those who are certain and assured of God's love, well, those who are assured of God's love in their lives are shielded from the wrath of God. We're shielded from God's judgment. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And here is why we have no fear in judgment. Verse 17 says, as he is, so also are we in this world. Well, how is he talking about Jesus? He is righteous. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be made righteous in God, that we might be the righteousness of God. So as he is, so also are we. Where? In heaven? No, here, right now. If you have the love of God abiding upon you, that's because you have his righteousness imputed to you. You have his righteousness and we have no fear then of his judgment. We have no fear of a guilty verdict. Therefore, we see, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. May I say that if you live in fear of God's judgment, if you fear meeting the God who created you, it is because you have not been perfected in his love. Something is missing in your life. But take heart because of what verse 19 tells us. We love because he first loved us. You see, this is why it counts. This is how we are able to love because he first loved us. So may I say to you that if there is any desire in your heart to love God, it is only because he has first loved you. But the love of God expects something from us. The love of God is a demanding love. We see in verse 21, anyone, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. You see, I do believe that there are those who try to skirt their fear of judgment by making simple and general confessions. Oh, I love God. Certainly I love God. Sure, I love God. But he says here, if anyone says that, but they don't love their brother, they're lying. They're not telling the truth. Therefore, you are standing with the wrath of God upon you and should be in fear of judgment because the love of God demands for us to love our brothers and sisters. You see, loving my brother is not a choice. Loving others is not optional when the spirit of love lives in us. Because you see, God took the initiative to love me. I should also take that initiative to love others, even those who are so difficult to love. Listen to this last verse. And this commandment we have from him. 
whoever loves God must also love his brothers. Now I want to ask you a question. When we hear that phrase, commandment, and this commandment we have from him, do you read that? Do you hear that as a chore? Or do you hear that as a blessing? Do you hear the commandment of God in your life as something to be laboured? Or do you see that as something to be a blessing in your life? And depending on how you answer that question says a lot about your relationship with God. You see, when we are assured of God's love, that love will, will turn responsibility into desire. And when we understand the completeness of that love, when we are so assured of that love, so confident in the love of God, well, it will turn that desire into delight. I mean, we just want to love. We want to do what God says. In one sense, we obey God because we have to, yes. We are subservient to God because we are servants of God. But we are also sons and daughters of God. And through that love relationship, we grow in knowledge and faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. And it turns that into a desire. It turns those commands into our desire. Lord, I want to do that. That's why David said, Lord, I delight in your law. Your law, your commands are like honey dripping from a honeycomb. It's sweet when God commands us. So now we've transitioned from just having to obey God to wanting to obey God. My dad was the chief of police in the little town I, I grew up. He was a law enforcer in our town and he was the law enforcer in our home. Now I messed up a lot as a kid, but I promise you I didn't do near as much as I could have. And here is why I didn't do a lot of what I could have done. I was absolutely terrified of my daddy. I mean, scared to death of him. He was a law enforcement. It wasn't because he was mean. My dad just, he loved me, but my dad had rules and you didn't break those rules. As I grew older and as I grew more independent, I began to be able to make more decisions in my life for myself. You know, something changed in the relationship that I had with my daddy. There was a time when I did what I had to do because he told me to. But as that relationship was nurtured and as I grew in the relationship with my dad and grew to respect my dad and love my dad, well, I ended up not doing a lot of things out of respect and honor for my dad. It became a desire to want to honor my mother and my father. God's word says, honor your mother and your father. You know what? That's not a job. That's a blessing. And when we see those relationships grow and nurture, what can be seen as a responsibility can then be seen as a blessing in our life. And this is the completeness of God's love. We don't live out of fear. We live for God out of love. So be certain. I hope that you are certain of God's love and I hope you understand the blessing of how assured assurance of God's love can, can reward you richly in your life as you live on this earth for him. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will do that through all of us as members of this church and as members of his body. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love that you've given to us so that we don't have to live in fear. And we don't have to fear your commands and we don't have to fear the requirement that you place on our life to love others. But we can see those commands as a blessing in our life. Lord, we get to love one another. What a blessing it is to love one another. What a blessing it is to show that love, to demonstrate patience, to demonstrate um, endurance and forgiveness and all of those things. Lord, we... We don't love to a fault. We love to forgive. We love to express 
self-control and generosity and kindness. And so, Lord, I pray that we would recognize what John is saying to us as believers and we would take these things into our hearts and we would live all of the days of our life being absolutely convinced and certain of the love that you have for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you and may God bless his word in your lives.